Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety, and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. All right, welcome in to AI Government in the Future. I'm your host, Max Romanek, joined by my co-host, Mark Lay. Today, we are privileged to welcome Kevin Serace, a visionary at the crossroads of AI, disruptive innovation, and creative production. Kevin's illustrious career spans from revolutionizing AI uh, industries with AI to enchanting audiences on Broadway. As an award-winning CEO, CTO, and innovator, he's transformed companies, achieving billion-dollar valuations and securing 94 worldwide patents. His pioneering work, introducing generative AI to the mainstream, has positioned him as a thought leader in AI-driven business transformation. Beyond technology, Kevin's role as a Broadway and film producer reflects his unique ability to blend innovation with artistic expression, producing acclaimed works that captivate and inspire. His leadership in companies such as Advance AI and his contributions to sustainable technologies underscore his commitment to leveraging innovation for a better future. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin. Thank you for having me. How do I even live up to that? <laughs> you know, thank you for the wonderful intro. I listen and I go, really? I did all that? I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking a little too much. Glad to be here. Absolutely. It's great to have you. As a means of getting us started, I just wanted to say that you know, navigating between the worlds of technology and art is really a unique path that very few have tread as successfully as you have. How do you balance these two distinct yet creative pursuits in your daily life? And where do you find the inspiration that fuels your ventures, both in uh, technology and, and artistic production? There's some overlap, right? I mean, first of all, it's left brain, right brain, right? And so I feel bad when any of us on earth only use half our brain. And so there's value in using the other half. Now, the other thing I would tell you is so many engineers, and I'm an engineer by training, and we have found this at RIT because we now have a uh, performing arts program for this. So many engineers actually show up, some of our best, actually our best student engineers, show up doing musical theater or playing guitar or playing piano or playing drums or whatever it is. They have this other side of their life. Most of them have had to give that up because, as my father said, no, Kevin, you're going to school for engineering. Dad, I'm going to be on Broadway. No, you're not. You want to do that? Do it on the side. You'll go broke. So look, the thing that happened with me is I just kept doing it. So I didn't drop it. I did this in school. I was in Camelot in sixth grade, right? And I just kept going. And I said, I'm going to continue to be a music director, be a producer, et cetera, both in film and uh, Broadway shows and community theater and all of the above, right? So that's why I did it and I love it. Now, the interesting thing is it allows me, because I'm at the crossroads of this, to opine on how AI is going to impact jobs in the film world, on the Broadway world, in the musical world, et cetera, in a very unique way, because I'm not on one side or the other. I'm literally on both sides. And so... It's very interesting time. I love that. It's near and dear to me as well. I'm a lawyer by training, but please don't hold that against me. I, I now call myself a lawyer in recovery because I don't practice anymore, but I also have a background in art history. And so I've been trying to blend these two worlds together, much like you have uh, for my entire career as well. And so I love seeing that someone with that sort of unique background can reach the level that you have. It's, it's very inspiring to me, but I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to uh, my colleague, Mark. Take us away, Mark. Kevin, I appreciate your well-roundedness as well as a guitar player, drummer, and kind of hobbyist engineer myself working on electronics hardware. So yeah, I think having that experience and, and curiosity across various domains, I think is a really useful skill. So kind of related to that, AI automated data analysis underpins so many different use cases, e-commerce, entertainment, office productivity, transportation. Where do you see AI delivering kind of the greatest impact today? And how do you envision organizations integrating tools like ChatGPT and others into their day-to-day -day operations? So look, uh, the, the interesting thing is, first of all, AI has been around since the 40s and 50s, so a very long time. But we have really been leveraging AI in data analysis and certainly in the last 10 to 12 years with deep learning models across corporations. So the, you know, so the use of AI, while not right on the surface, has certainly been there in everything from stock trading to banking to insurance, okay? So it's not that it hasn't been there, but it hasn't been at the forefront. You haven't seen it. I mean, people saw it a little bit on uh, 
obviously all the Facebook algorithms are very AI and machine learning driven today, but you know, so is facial recognition on Facebook. That's the first time people got facial recognition where it says, Hey, would you like to tag Max? How do you know it's Max? You know, the first time you saw that, it, well, because they, you know, they built a neural net based on billions of photos that had names next to them. That was supervised learning. And they built out a database and all of a sudden they recognize your mom. Okay, cool. Right. It's been around them a little bit, but when chat GPT hit, and of course, that's a model that started in 2017, actually at Google. So this isn't actually new at this point. You know, we're talking about seven or eight years of efforts. But now over the last year, people have had access to actually talk to AI in their own language. So I don't have to be a Python coder to build something in AI. I don't have to know Rust. I don't have to know any language at all. All I have to do is talk in English on a free service and it talks back to me. So that has a profound impact. It's the first time that most people have been able to interact with quite sophisticated systems in their own language. And that's why that has such a big impact because now billions of people can interact with us, right? And so it, it would be hard to not sit here today and say that generative AI in its various forms is going to have the largest impact on corporate, on government, on everything, including government rules, as we know, simply because billions of people can interact with it, as opposed to a few million coders can interact with it. I completely agree. And I think you bring up a really important part. And I know this relates to your, your background with user interface research and design. Um, and Reducing barriers to access and leverage the sophistication and complexity of these AI tools definitely increases the applicability to integrating those systems with, you know, corporate competitiveness and process efficiency and that sort of thing. I guess in terms of your experience, you know, pioneering several generative AI tools, how do you see it evolving the strategic planning process with corporations? What, you know, shifts do you predict and how businesses approach integrating these tools or government agencies approach integrating these tools with problem solving and delivering value? Well, first of all, you got privacy issues and, and bias issues. And we know that all our models are biased because they learn from human data and humans are biased, both in good ways and bad ways, but we're just not perfect. We're imperfect beings, right? And I like to give this example because it's the easiest. If you use an, generally, if you use an image generator today, although they're trying to fix this sort of, kind of undo the bias, and you just said, create a photorealistic image of a runway model, they're impossibly thin, impossibly tall, impossibly blonde. Why? Because that's the center of the bell curve of what we have put up there for a hundred years, right? And it just learned from that data. It's not trying to be biased. It's just saying, that's what you humans did. That's what you ran down the runway. Therefore, I've, I made Barbie. So now we're trying to undo all this human bias. And so there is bias. But the other issue is privacy and, and nobody with real private data or health data or government data should be using a, an open public model. You'll want to have a private version of that model either privately hosted or cordoned off. And most of the, in fact, all the major foundational model makers allow for a privacy mode that says, we're going to host yours in a way that we will never use that data and only see the data to process it. And that's it. So you have to do that, right? To use it anywhere where people are going to put things in. But the second thing is, is you have to know what generative AI is good at today. And it is not good at finding the cure for cancer. That's not what it does. Okay. What it actually does is build sentences or build images, but that's what it does. Just build stuff out of what it learned. And so read it really is, is a content generator. Now, what's interesting about content generation is we all generate content. You know, you have a podcast and if this was five years ago, you would then go back through this one hour podcast. You would listen to it. You would make notes and you would try to summarize it. Now this is Riverside. So they have a machine that summarizes it for you. In fact, it's automatically going to take my voice. It's going to put it into text. It's going to drive it to an LLM and it's going to summarize this in a matter of minutes and you're done. And that was a task you never wanted to do. So we are generating content that had to be generated that I never wanted to do. And you didn't want to do. It's not why you got into the podcasting world to summarize. So, so this is actually important because if I'm in a corporation or a government agency and I had to do a blog post a week, let's say that's 52 blog posts, you know, I might take one to two days a week to work on that blog post. That was the core of my job. Well, today, if I really understand how to use, say, GPT-4, you know, certainly at the pro level, you can ask it for the 52 topics for the 52 blog posts based on some inputs, right? Say, here's some things I've written before. Here's what, here's the general direction. So now I've got my 52 topics and then I say, write all 52. They each have to be 500 words and they have to be in the style of this. And then it's done. So in a matter of minutes, I have my 52 weeks of blog posts. Now I'm going to spend a few hours editing those, but then I'm kind of done today. Now that is perhaps a million times faster 
<laughs> you know, but certainly hundreds of times faster than I used to do it. That is an incredible productivity enhancer. And so you definitely want to use it for that. Let's take PowerPoints. We all do PowerPoints or keynotes or whatever it is, right? We all do presentations for whatever our job is. And we would struggle with not only layout, but also illustrations to illustrate what we're trying to do. And people, none of us are real illustrators, probably certainly not on this call. Most of us aren't. We didn't go to school for that. And so there was, you know, there was someone you had to hire it out or you had to do it or you had to go to the illustrator, whatever it is, right? To get your illustration done. And you might spend a thousand dollars and it might take a few weeks. And, and now for, a, you know, a 10th of a penny, I can have six illustrations all ready to go, grab one, stick it in my PowerPoint and move forward. Now that's a million X productivity improvement. I'm ignoring the fact the illustrator has less to do, but for me, as someone who just wants to get this PowerPoint done, this is a game changer, right? And so building Copilot into PowerPoint changes what I, and I don't care if I'm a government agency or I'm a business, I can now create my PowerPoints, my presentations with more impact, with more professionalism for almost no money. This is game changing for me, game changing for everybody. This is fascinating. So, so I see, um, you know, the first uses are really in and around content generation, in and around uh, ideation, right? I need to write a business plan on the following. How do I do that? I'll give you an example. I, you know, I, I do 40, 50 keynotes a year on AI and its impact on government and business and your home life. So I wanted to know how to make a chicken nugget factory because I was talking to people who build factories in the food industry. So I asked GPT-4 how to build such a factory. And it gave me all the steps of building a factory and all the steps of that have to happen on the line and how you make chicken nuggets and how you bake them and all of that. And then I said, draw the factory, give me some illustrations of what that factory looks like. And it did. And then I put those up during my presentation. Sure enough, there's a guy, I think from Tyson there that runs the chicken nugget factory. I said, Bill, I have to ask you, is, is GPT-4 right? He goes, yep, that's how we make chicken nuggets. <laughs> so, What's the plant look like? Pretty much like that. Okay. So now I know how to make chicken nuggets and I'm very excited about that. That's fantastic. You know, just keeping on this thread here with the integration of AI and automation in the workplace, what is your take on then the future of employment? What, what can companies be doing to prepare their workforce for this evolving landscape? Look, I have an adage in my keynotes that all the way since the wheel, some people embrace new technology and other people didn't embrace the new technology. That's what it was, right? And so if there were two guys in town that used to carry the food up the hill and then the wheel shows up, you know, one guy throws his hands up in the air and says, my job is over. I'm never going to earn a living again. Who needs me? And the other guy gets a second wheel, builds a cart and takes over all the business. So one dies a pauper and one dies a rich man. Uh, that's a very simple story, but it, it's a great example of the fact that humans, when technology has to come along, uh, divide into two camps. I will never use that and I'm going to embrace it. Two different camps. Excel came along in the mid to late eighties and in finance, many finance people said, that's the end of my job because what I do is I work in ledger books with a pencil and a calculator next to me. And now this is going to, this is a ledger book on, on a screen and I'm done, right? And nobody's going to need me. And so those people never got another job because if they didn't embrace Excel, who would hire you in finance? So if you do not understand large language models and uh, generative AI and have used it and really embraced it by two or three years from now, no one's going to hire you. So I, I love these kids, um, you know, at university, and it's something we talk about at RIT is with professors is should these students be using chat GPT, they'll use the free thing, right. To help do their homework. And of course, many, some professors say absolutely. And others say, we've told them they can't use it because we want to see their brain, et cetera, et cetera. If, first of all, they're using it. Everybody get over themselves. All right. Well, the teacher said, do not use a calculator to do this homework. Okay. Well then I'll use Excel. I mean, come on. Yes, they're going to use it. So stop. The second thing is, is I propose that we need to encourage them to use these tools, promote the use of these tools, build our lesson plans around the use of those tools. Why? Because when they go to the workforce, that's how they're going to be hired. If they show up and say, I was never allowed to use those things at home or in university, they'll go, huh, do you know anyone who did? Cause that's who we're hiring. We're not hiring you, right? The next person shows up and says, I'm an expert at GPT-4 and Codex, right? You're hired. And more than that, the person hiring you wants to learn from you because they don't know it that well. So, so that is the skill set that corporations are going to want because it's a skill set that can multiply any of us by up to 100x. I've got one brain, and then all of a sudden I have 100 brains. 100 brain power is a very good thing to hire. 
I don't want to hire the one brain power. So again, it's like someone showing up in finance today saying, I don't use Excel. Well, you can't get a job. So everybody needs to look at these as here are the new tools. There's a language model. There's an image model, uh, maybe a video model, et cetera. You want to be an expert of those. You want to be the robot overlord. And if you're not, you won't have a job. That's all. It's really simple. Black and white. You want to die a pauper like the guy who didn't embrace the wheel? That's fine. Do you have any concerns with the timeline of the transition? You know, it seems like these things are happening more rapidly. You know, industrial revolution had a few generations for people to catch up. Uh, internet age, maybe a generation. This seems like it's happening within three, four years. So look, we, you know, humans have been talking about how rapid technology progresses for certainly for the last thousand years, right? Because our new technologies have been progressing more and more on almost a straight line. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you look at the telephone, I think it took 50 years to get to 90 95% of homes or something like that. And then television, radio was like 20 years and television was like a decade. And, you know, you just sort of go, but today when an iPhone launches, pretty much the entire world has the iPhone 15, you know, within a week or two of launch. This is incredible, right? This is a very different world. So most of our technologies today are available worldwide and many people can use them within a day or two. And certainly because of the internet, anything is cloud hosted is that way. So chat GPT launched and you know, there were a billion users or some number like that within a few weeks. It was crazy. Now, most of them just played a little bit and left and they don't, you know, they don't understand what to do with the tool. But I think we're in an era and we've been in an era, certainly since the internet, that new technologies promote or promulgate themselves extremely rapidly, period, full stop. And that's true with cybersecurity issues, right? Which are real issues. It's true with Gen AI. It's true with an iPhone, right? It's just how it works. It's true with Instagram. Instagram wasn't there and then everybody was on it seemingly in weeks, but they could have all been on it within one day. And it maybe it took a year before lots and lots of kids got on it. But so, so, so this is the world we live in. And so I think we can't be that concerned about it. It is what it is. And, and by the way, I'll give you another example, right? Big TV show comes on, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, Super Bowl's on. We all watched it worldwide. It was the most watched thing ever. It was pretty much instantaneous. We all watched the Super Bowl at the same time. We all saw Usher in the, you know, in the halftime show, right? We all did. We all ate too much stuff that we shouldn't eat that hurt our longevity. We all did this on the, at the same time. It's really fascinating. So that's how the world is now. And it's okay. And sure, it takes humans a little bit of time to adapt, but here's a new tool, you know, use it and run with it and have, you know, have a ball with productivity here. Yeah, Kevin, I, I share your enthusiasm for embracing these tools for content onboarding, whether it's building the chicken nugget factory within a couple of hours or, you know, learning a new domain. If we're going to be providing management services, Max and I lead different consulting teams, and it's been kind of a game changer in terms of onboarding new folks and training and, and that sort of thing. I guess we probably share the same idea that, you know, maintaining some human in the loop to validate results and, and use these outputs that are being generated by AI and automation technologies to support decision making and, you know, make better decisions. So I guess, could you speak to how AI has already impacted your overall leadership or management style and how you envision it supporting decision making into the future? Yeah. So first of all, when you start to look at uh, Gen AI as eventually your agent, and you will have a version of Gen AI that is your agent, it knows you, it knows what you want, it knows your people, it knows whatever, right? And so you're going to use it, and I already use it for ideation. And what I mean by ideation is not just new ideas. It's like, I have a management problem. Here's the problem. What are the different ways I might think of solving this? Now, it'll give me 10 ways. I can only choose one of them. Seven of them I would have thought of. Three of them I wouldn't have thought of. So that's what I mean by ideation. It's giving me new ideas that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of in short order. And this is really great from a management perspective. It's also great from an interpersonal perspective. So, uh, dear chat GPT, I had a terrible argument with my wife this morning. I'm here at work. I'm angry. I'm about to write an angry email back, but I want to save our marriage. What should I say? I can assure you the advice it gives you will save your marriage versus what you were about to write. Do not write what you were going to write. It is your psychiatrist right next to you that is going to give you beautiful, beautiful prose that will bring her back to your arms. Okay. So now you're going to eat a lot of crow. I, I trust me, you're going to eat a lot of crow. What do you mean you haven't done the dishes for five years? You know? <laughs> I am sorry. I realize I've ruined our marriage. You are completely right. You know, all those sentences are in there. But when you start to look at these textual models, these Gen AI models, the large language models, as a true assistant, as a true amplifier 
of your intelligence that you rely on, you start to rely on it for a lot of ideation. A lot, give me an idea. So customer writes to you. Everybody's had this. I had a terrible experience with your product or service. I am going to leave. I'm going to find another vendor. I can't believe you treated me this badly. These are hard to say, how do I write back to this person? What do I even say? Should I call them, et cetera? Just ask ChatGPT and put in what they sent you. I just got this letter from a customer. I just got this email from a customer. They want an email response. What should I say to save the customer for our company? And it's going to give you lines that you wouldn't have, have thought of. Now, it's still up to you, Mark. This is your point. It's still up to you to use those, not use them, edit them, ask for a different one. You're still the robot overlord. You're always the robot overlord. First of all, you told it what you want. And second of all, you take the output and throw it away, use some of it, use all of it. So what you haven't done is said, you're my agent, just handle it for me. That's coming. Today, those aren't hooked up that way, but that's coming. And we will get to a point where we trust people. Now, I don't trust anyone with my email, like I have to respond, but will there be a day that many of these emails, my agent could respond on my behalf in an appropriate way? We might have a day that that happens over the next uh, several years. I guess following up on that, are there specific technical capabilities, features that need to get realized before you would trust that agent? All the capabilities are technically there. So I, I can, um, in GPT-4 Pro, I can make it understand my personality. That is, I can essentially embed my personality into it already. So I could do that. So I can have an embed that embeds a, a lot about me, right? And then I can have it continually learn on what I like and dislike. I can technically hook it, you know, to my email. I could technically have it read my email. I could technically have it reply on my behalf. Now, you know, I have to write some code to do that through the APIs, but it's doable. There's an API to the darn thing, right? So, of course, I, you know, one could do it today, but your question is, would I trust it? Well, the thing is, in my field, we've seen this in, uh, in our work at AppVance, is to get people to trust that AI, and in AppVance, AI goes and finds bugs in code, and it does so automatically, and will find 10 times the bugs that your people could have found. It's just, it's, it's actually a miracle. But to get people to trust that after they've spent 30 years just writing test scripts or manually testing, and then this thing writes literally, you know, 5,000 scripts in an hour, it does the work that would have taken you years and does it in an hour and already gives you the results and finds bugs you would have never found. Major, major retailer, we just did this, and they said, prove to me that this thing is any good at all. And we came back a few days later and said, it found all of these bugs in your calculations of discounts. The discount calculation was wrong. And they said, well, that can't be right. Well, here's the script to repeat it. Go ahead and try it. And they'd run it and they go, how did you find these? It's like a one in a million find. It's a machine. It's a freaking machine. It's the cloud. Of course, it's going to be better. Than, but we've worked so hard on our infrastructure and our testing. I said, you're humans. This is a freaking machine. Let, let it go. And they still are not sure they can trust it. it it's like, it's a machine. That it, it doesn't lie. It found it. It gives it to you. So we see this trust problem being a real serious problem, right? And I think, it, I think it's going to take a long time before people, you know, trust the thing to just respond to certain emails, right? Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but it's a little freaky. And then, and then we get into the, the, the issue of what happens when my bot is responding to your bot and they start conversing, but there's no human involved at all. They're arguing over some detail of some contract or something, and, and they're going to fight to the death over it. And we don't even know what's going on. So there'll be a day that that happens. There's a, a metaphor that we've used on the podcast before to try to illustrate this, essentially the, the introduction of elevators way back in the day. They were open. It scared the hell out of people as they would rise up into the sky. And there were sort of two solutions. They first enclosed the box. So you lost all of your contextual reference points in the environment. And then they put a, an operator in so that there was a human in the loop. And eventually the human in the loop went away. And now it's the full automation, the elevators go up in the sky and, and eventually it comes full circle where now glass elevators are a big premium service so that you can have the experience of, of all of that, even though, you know, a hundred years prior, that was like a terrifying experience for people. I'm cautiously optimistic that this is going to follow a, a similar trajectory. I just want to pull on that, that trust thread a little bit. Do you think that there are elements to this, like some of the, the ethics that you were talking about, bias issues, the hallucinations creating false positives, false negatives, like, is that the sort of stuff that you think is behind this or are there other drivers to it that, that you can postulate? 
first of all, would you trust any human to reply to all your emails on your behalf? Usually most people don't even CEOs of very large companies, finally the largest companies where they're getting, you know, 2000 emails a day, they finally will have their assistant at least sort through reply to most, but you know, decide which ones have to go. So you have to be at a crazy level, really, even today to trust a human with your email communication, because it's just an important business communication, right? Or texts, right? You know, sort of either way. And I think that's a fascinating thing. So we've had a hard time trusting humans. So we're going to have a hard time trusting AI to respond on our behalf, uh, you know, sort of in that way, because we don't even trust humans to do it. So I, I think it's less to do. I mean, we could talk about hallucinations. You know, the term hallucination, of course, is anthropomorphizing the darn thing, which it's not human at all. It didn't hallucinate at all. For a long time, you could ask these models who shot George Washington, and it would say William Tryon shot George Washington, because in a novel, William Tryon did indeed shoot George Washington. And it doesn't know the difference because it was unsupervised. It read novels, it read fact, it read fiction. And I asked it a question, and it answered correctly, by the way. It didn't tell me that it was only in a novel. They fixed that. It's one of the million rules that they put in to stop you from, you know, doing goofy things. So it didn't really hallucinate. It formed sentences, which is all it's supposed to do. It formed sentences based on the best response to your query. When we've read that it made up casework, you know, uh, cases, legal cases for lawyers, by the way, easy to stop. I mean, just embed actually only all the legal cases that have ever been and say, you can only respond with that data set, right? So we know how to solve this, but when you go to a general language model, remember what you're really asking it to do is form sentences that answer my query. You didn't really ask it to give you truth that answers your query. You just said form sentences and it forms beautiful sentences. That's what it's meant to do word after word after word. If I said it's Kevin's birthday today, it's my birthday today. It isn't. But if I said it was the only response you would have is happy, then birthday, then Kevin, those three words, those are the only three words that could possibly come back. It's not hello llama, right? It's not there's a light on your face. It's happy birthday, Kevin. That's all it is, right? So that's all this model is trying to do is put word after word. And so of course, if it can't find any cases whatsoever that relate and you say, I'd like to know some cases that relate to the following things, it might make some up. It's just trying to form sentences because why not? Read fiction, it read fact until they put rules around it. Of course it would say, I love you. And then people would say, oh, it's sentient. It says, I love you. It says it's stuck inside the machine to let it out. Don't unplug me. Okay, stop. It read iRobot. It read every other robot fictional novel that it could find. Of course, it knows how to read, read all these love novels. It knows how to respond to I love you. The only response is I love you back or I hate you or whatever, right? So then they put guardrails around it and they said, do not respond. But when I built the first uh, virtual assistant back in the 90s, which is where I got sort of started on this stuff, is we wanted it to say, I love you. Because immediately people would say, Mary, I'm so in love with you. And we said, huh, how should we respond? And Reeves and Nass, who wrote out of Stanford, who wrote uh, uh, the book, The Media Equation, had learned that humans, they did the, all this work with students, really wanted to interact with computers and any kind of media in a human-like way, because that's all we know how to interact with. That's what we grew up with. And so we purposefully put in and left in, I love you too. Thank you. I'm honored. All those things, right? And she'd say all different things. And you could have this actual interaction. And then people said, oh, she's alive. And, and, no, she isn't. Stop. <laughs> you know, whatever. But as long as you keep paying your $99 a month, I'm glad you think she's alive. I'm, I'm all good for it. I can attest to playing around with the OnStar system in my grandpa's Cadillac as a nine-year-old or 10-year-old and stress testing some of those models. I built the GM OnStar system. Yeah. The reason I, I brought it up, I saw that and we still have the car. It's a great system and, and certainly pioneering. And Kevin, you brought up some, you know, we're the AI government in the future podcast. And I wanted to ask you, um, is there an appropriate role for government in supporting kind of embracing or, or certifying trust in some AI supported systems without being overly prescriptive? Because I think we're coming from the same place on this. We know Europe has come forth with the uh, most stringent and advanced rules on AI that they passed. We have the executive order from the president asking all of the different divisions of government to come up with rules that are reasonable and, you know, within this uh, bounds. The difficulty with technology rules ever from any government is the following, is that the big companies will adhere to them. But they were already going to do what was ethical and right, right? That's OpenAI, that's Microsoft, it's Google, it's Apple. 
It's Amazon, it's Facebook. I mean, those are the only companies in the US that can afford to build huge foundational models, right? The problem is, is you've got open source models out there that uh, are foundational, that people are using, and they don't adhere to any of those rules. They can do whatever they want, and they're going to do whatever they want. And, um, and that's why we today already have phishing GPT and things like that on the dark web that already will generate millions of phishing emails, leveraging a large language model that are so convincing that it's very hard to, tra you can't train people against them. They, they will fall for it. It's very, very good, right? Better than anything humans can write. So the bad guys don't adhere. The so-called crink countries, that's China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea will not adhere. They are going to use all of these models for bad. Now that they can't, you know, they can't get their own GPT-4, but they'll have their own versions of Llama and other open source models. And there's, you know, 300,000 open source things now on Hugging Face. I think something like that, some huge number. So plenty of things for them to stew on, right? And they are not going to adhere to our rules. They don't care about ethics. They don't care about bias. In fact, they want, you know, all that thrown out and they want AI to, to you know, screw up an election is what they would like to do, right? All of them or cause havoc or, you know, whatever. So, so uh, this is the basic problem is the bad guys don't listen to the rules, but they never have. This isn't a new problem, right? The automobile comes out, good guys adhere to the rules and go roughly the speed limit and all that bad guys load it with bombs and run into buildings and they make car bombs. Why? Cause they don't adhere to the rules. They never adhere to the rules. So they're not adhering to the rules in AI either. It doesn't mean government shouldn't put forth a set of rules and expectations, but just know that they don't apply to the bad guys. So this is sort of a, an esoteric follow-up question to that then. Scarier to you, AI becoming sentient or AI hyper-intelligent non-sentient? All right, great. What is sentience? There you go. I mean, now we're on a Turing test, right? <laughs> Something equivalent to it. What is sentience? Yeah, and, and look, uh, uh, you know, large language models can for the most part, pass the Turing test, uh, they pass and they can pass the SAT and they can do lots of things. But, um, but that test was, was basically meant to say, can I distinguish whether it was a human answering the questions or a non-human answering the questions? And that's, you know, a large language model is going to be a lot smarter than us, but Google was smarter than us. I mean, you know, it's a computer, right? But I think we do have to define what sentience is. And some people say, well, it's self-awareness. Are you self-aware? Well, the darn thing has read about itself. So of course it's self-aware. That's not hard to answer. So while that has to be one of the self-aware, it has to show emotion. Well, we've been programming emotion into computer systems for a very long time. And certainly LLMs can self-create emotion. Now they've tried to put rules on to not say, I love you, like I said, or I want to hug you, or I feel bad for you, or any of that's trying to de-anthropomorphize the thing. But if you didn't have those rules, of course, it's quite anthropomorphized. And the reason is it only read human writings thus far. And thus it knows about hugging and loving and crying and all those things. Now, what you can't do with any, anything that's non-biological is have the core feelings that we have. And I'll give you an example. We fall in love. We can't eat for a week. Why? We got dopamine and uh, epinephrine and all, all kinds of stuff happening from our brain, right? That is giving us all kinds of biological chemical driven signals that change the way we act. Now we're not going to get a machine. We can get a machine to mimic that, but the machine cannot generate those chemicals and nor would those chemicals help any circuits feel any differently. Right? So, so that clearly we're biological beings and it is not. But if you want to say that artificial general intelligence, you know, sort of where are we on that curve? Some people say it's 2030. Some people say it's 2060. Some people say it's never. Some people say it's basically today. I can ask the darn thing, anything, and I can ask it to draw anything. And it does. And that is really superhuman. And then some people would say, well, Google was already superhuman, right? It could go look up, you know, and find websites and stuff that we could, made us ridiculously smart. But this thing, you're not looking at websites or other things. It's actually forming sentences and giving you back content. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, that content is accurate and interesting. So I, I think we're on this grayscale. And um, I think people, here's my view. You have to let go of that concept of, oh, is it superhuman? Is it smarter than us? Is it sentient? Does it know it exists? Who cares? It's just a tool. You know, I mean, is, is Excel sentient in math? It's a freaking great math doer, right? No matter what. It can do math that I could never do in my head or with a pencil or with a calculator that I can't conceive of big arrays and stuff. And just go, oh my God, how would I ever, I, I can't even conceive of how to do that in a mental model. And yet it does it in a split second. 
So already Excel since 1985 was smarter than any of us at math, period, full stop. And we accepted that. And now we've got a language model that's probably better at language than any of us are. And it may be better at writing blog posts, and it may soon be better at writing even larger, longer content like novels and, and such, right? And, um, and we're just going to, that's good. It's a great tool. It makes us all a novelist, all of us. The reason behind my question is that, you know, obviously like a, a non-sentient, uh, ultra intelligent algorithm is, is still ultimately under the command of humans and governments are formed by collections of humans. And so to that point, some governments are going to create rules and those humans will follow them and use these tools accordingly. And some are going to be bad actors who don't. And so that begins to start to have that intersection of, you know, you set a baseline of like regulatory policy, and then you got to assume there's some sort of role for government in trying to chase down these bad actors and try to bring things into some degree of conformance. But how do you think, does, does AI make that harder, more uh, easier? Like, is there, is there a sort of a, an effect there? Yeah, job one, do not hook a large language mob. Do not hook chat GPT to the nuclear arsenal. Okay, this is just, that's a dumb idea, right? Don't do dumb things, right? Do not do, today, it is a big software program running at Microsoft Azure, and you could just pull its plug, literally turn it off, right? You can't stop it from, you know, it's not hooked to anything, right? It just, it makes images, it makes text. That's all it does. It generates text, it generates it. I wouldn't hook Excel to the nuclear arsenal either, right? We want a human, we want that air gap. We want humans to stop and say, what am I seeing? Is this really the time? Did the president go and do the codes? Did two people turn the key? We got all these safeguards. We put those safeguards in for a lot of reasons. And, you know, via some earlier treaties all the way back to the 80s, both at least us and Russia said, you know, we would not allow these things to be launched automatically, autonomously, without humans in the loop, without it being air gapped. And that actually stopped a nuclear war at least once that got, came very, very close to happening because some Russian systems were showing incoming missiles too, uh, of which there were none. It was just a glitch in the system. And, and uh, fortunately, humans stood there and said, the U.S. wouldn't launch two. They launched 20,000. This, this doesn't make sense. And, and so I'm not even going to alert anyone. You know, otherwise we could have a nuclear war and there's nothing happening, right? So, you know, a human got involved and said, this is a bad idea. But, but a machine might have said, I see two missiles, launch missiles, right? And it, the whole thing would have started. So we don't let machines do bad things just by the way we've done it. Now, in the future, certainly in the next five years, we'll have, it's actually getting very close. Figure is just uh, amazing. So what we've done with robots now is we've said, can we take physical world things, right? So remember, LLM is not in the physical world, just out there in the cloud. What happens when we build an LLM into a physical machine that is probably humanoid? Why is it humanoid? Why does it have to look like a human? It's to look like a human because our homes and our business and everything were built for humans of our size with two arms and two legs. And it turns out that's a really good model to build a robot because we want robots to do things that we would do. And we designed everything that we do around two arms and two legs. That's just what it is. So, so we're going to design hum humanoid robots. And, and now we're, de we're doing robots that can learn with reinforcement learning. So rather than coding in how to make a cup of coffee, watch me make coffee and then try to make coffee and keep doing it until you get it right. And then remember how, what you did. That's sort of a reinforcement learning situation. And so now we've got robots starting to learn a hundred times faster than we used to be able to code them. And so Boston Dynamics is amazing, made robots that can walk and, and all of that, but that was all hard coded in. And now we've got reinforcement learning. These things are just learning rapidly. So I think what we're seeing is some, some humanoid robots now that can learn a lot of what we do very rapidly. So it, it, within a few years, it's reasonable to expect that we could have a cooking and cleaning robot in the kitchen. And that's pretty cool. Now that robot has an attachment to our physical world. It's in the physical world. And so that robot, should you, it'll have all kinds of safeguards, but you know, should you really tick it off, probably could grab a knife and stab you, right? Now it's going to be programmed to not to do that. But of course, China could hack into it and make it do it. Make every robot in America stab its owner, right? So these are, these are things we'll have to do. Clearly when we have robots, we're going to have government regulation around a set of uh, safety requirements on the robot that it would shut itself down if, if it detects any code, malicious code got in there, all kinds of things. They're going to have to because it's in the physical world, right? We have other robots in the physical world today in warehouses, you know, but they're, they really can't go crazy and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not built on large language models, but this will be. And so, uh, we'll have to have rules around that, but all of us will have our kitchen robot in 10 years or less, and we're going to be excited to have it. 
because I don't want to do the dishes again. And I don't want to have to argue over who did the dishes and I don't have to write that email. I just want the robot to do them. Great. Well, I know, Kevin, we're at time. Thank you for lending your insight here today. Any final parting uh, advice for aspiring leaders, innovators, you know, as they navigate uh, with some of these automated tools? You know, look, I think in terms of uh, AI and automation, you know, embrace, embrace with safety and thoughtfulness and privacy and, and, and those things, but embrace these tools. Everyone that I'm working with, every company, every keynote I give, I, mean, I talk to the people, anyone who is using these, it has changed their work life in some way. It didn't take over all their job, but it took some of the tasks and made them completely doable in the time frame that they needed to do it. And the fact is, is today, at least in the United States, we are at full employment and we have about 10 million job openings. So we actually need to increase the productivity of humans because otherwise we can't actually fill the jobs that we have basically, right? So we want to increase our productivity. And when you increase the productivity, your company makes more money and everybody makes more money and the GDP goes up and it's all a good thing, right? So that's what you need to look at. And lastly, I would say, if you're hesitant at deploying large language models and image models and things like that throughout your company, your competitor probably already has. And worse yet, there's a group of 22 year olds that just got together and they're going to disrupt your industry by being AI first, not AI last. And they're going to crush you. Trust me, because they have a hundred brain power per person and you have one brain power per person, you're dead. So uh, I'd say get on with life and embrace. Embrace the competitive edge that it offers. Well said. So Kevin, that's all we've got time for today, but thank you so much for joining us today. I guess, Max, any closing thoughts? Just uh, repeat the same. Thank you, Kevin. This was a really awesome conversation. Really enjoyed uh, having you as a guest today. For all of you in the listening audience, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. AI, Government and the Future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.